Welcome back. All right, so I decided at trade deadline with all of the uh, chatter that was going on about the San Jose Sharks that I should do a video on the San Jose Sharks once the dust had settled on the trade deadline uh, because there's a lot of people who don't think Mike Greer's doing a good job. And Mike Greer is clearly getting taken to the cleaners. I'm not of the same mind. And I think Mike Greer walked into a job with the San Jose Sharks that um, a lot of people would say, eh, I'd, I'd rather not. The San Jose Sharks were a team that as recently as 2021, when Doug Wilson's still the general manager, were saying, we don't need to do a rebuild. And ownership has made it clear, we don't want to do a full-on rebuild. There's no need to tear things down and rebuild them. This is a team that was a contender not that long ago. But that's really not the way things work in sports. Teams just age out of contention. It does happen. But when we look at this team, and we look at what they're going through now, and, and I'll look through some of the more substantial trades during Greer's era. Um, he's been trying to dig his way out of these long-term contracts that were signed by Doug Wilson. Contracts that at the time were panned. Contracts people looked at and said, what are they doing? So most recently, uh, March 16th of 2022, they signed an eight-year extension to keep Tomas Hurdle. Then they fired the GM that signed it, and they brought in Mike Greer. Congratulations, here's an eight-year contract signed to a player in his late 20s. Uh, the San Jose Sharks late to the party in terms of how contracts are paid out now. Uh, the long-term extension to a guy in his late 20s, if you have one, like JT Miller in Vancouver is an example, and there are others, uh, but it's risky to have so many players who are going into their mid-30s on eight-year contracts, and that's where San Jose, I think, made some mistakes here. And so the eight-year extension to keep Hurdle rather than lose him um, at the time was seen as a win, but if we look at it right now, uh, Hurdle's been injured. He hasn't produced as well as he did before signing the extension. So I, I think trading him was the right call for San Jose, and I'll get into what they got back for him. Don't worry about it. So we go back to June 17th, 2019. They signed Eric Carlson to an eight-year extension. They had just finished the run to the conference final. Everybody was kind of, you know, excited about where San Jose was headed. Uh, though there were some who looked at San Jose's roster and said, ah, this run to the conference final may not be sustainable. But Eric Carlson, after signing the eight-year extension, said, we're going to have a great chance at winning the cup, not only next year, but for a lot of years moving forward. The expectation was, hey, we're a contender. We're going to remain a contender. There's no reason we can't. So, when everything fell apart in the 2019-2020 season, it really caused a lot of uh, consternation and a lot of head scratching. Also, that is when they allowed Joe Pavelski to go as a UFA. So by re-signing Carlson and giving him that huge extension, uh, they couldn't afford to keep Pavelski. Pavelski ends up in Dallas. As a Dallas fan, thanks. So <clears throat> for all of the complaints about Greer, I, I really honestly thought that Doug Wilson was making mistakes right, left, and center when it came to the eight-year extensions. Now, it's not necessarily Doug Wilson. It may very well be that somebody higher ups like, we want to hold these guys long-term. And July 1st of 2018, they signed Logan Couture to an eight-year extension, worth $8 million a year. Uh, July 1st of 2017, they signed Mark Edward Vlasic to an eight-year extension, worth $7 million a year. So money, 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 hand over fist. And again, eight years, eight years, eight years, eight years. And in each case, to a player whose best days productively uh, are either right now or behind them. And you know these contracts aren't necessarily going to age well and you're signing one every year. Eight years, eight years, eight years. And then there's a three-year break before you sign Hurdle to that eight-year that eight extension as well. So tough time, right? If you're a general manager, it's tough to look at all those eight-year deals, right? And they still have a couple of them on their books. So at the time that Mike Greer's hired, July 5th of 2022, the Sharks went 32, 37, and 13. And I remember the conversation being, so how about a rebuild? And the answer being, no, we don't want to do a rebuild. We're, we think we can contend for a playoff spot. To which, a couple years ago, a lot of people, myself included, thought, well, that's crazy. They're not contending for a playoff spot. So July 13th of 2022, about a week into his job, he trades Brent Burns. Uh, retaining $2.72 million of that contract. Uh, Lane Peterson goes to... Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes as well, and coming back to San Jose, Stephen Lawrence, uh, Etu McIniemi, who we haven't seen at the NHL level this season, uh, and a 2023 third that they used to draft Jaden Perron. So we don't know whether or not Jaden Perron's going to be an NHLer at this point. 
Uh, Burns has had a career renaissance with Carolina, but they had to make that move. That move, July 13th of 2022, allows Eric Carlson to have that fantastic season he had his last year in San Jose because you're not trying to split the time between Burns and Carlson. You don't have two number ones. You have an undisputed number one defenseman, and so Carlson parlays that into a 100-point season. August 29th, 2022, the mistake takes place. This this is a mistake. Uh, Aiden Hill going to the Las Vegas Golden Knights in exchange for a 2024 fourth-round pick. Now, I'm not saying Hill played great in San Jose, but I have always liked Hill going back to when he was with the Coyotes. Um, I remember people questioning my sanity for thinking Hill's a good goaltender. I remember seeing comments like, Why, what does THG see in Aiden Hill? And um, you now he's won a Stanley Cup and number one goaltender and... Yeah, a pretty good goaltender. He just needed the right break. I'm not saying if they hadn't traded Hill that Hill would have become the number one in San Jose. We have no idea. But looking back, uh, a fourth round draft pick, yeah, Vegas will pay that pay that price for a Stanley Cup. Sure, especially since they haven't had to worry about that draft pick that's been lost as of yet. So February 26, 2023, this is the first trade where we really see Greer getting criticized a lot where Timo Meyer ends up going to New Jersey. There's a $3 million retention on that contract. Uh, Zachary Emmond goes the other way, as well as Scott Harrington, uh, Santeri Hatika, uh, Timur Ibrahimov, as well as a 2024 fifth-round pick, which has been co- which had been Colorado's pick. Uh, and in exchange, er- San Jose gets back players, uh, Andreas Janssen, Fabian Zetterlund, Nikita Ahochik, who has since been swapped to Calgary for a draft pick, uh, Shakir Mahatmadulin, a 2023 first, which was used to draft Quentin Musty, as well as a 2024 second. I, w- I didn't put it on the board, I'll mention it here. There's a condition if New Jersey reaches the conference final this year that that upgrades to a first. New Jersey's not going to the conference final this year. And it, interestingly enough, part of the reason being, they did sign Meyer. They did sign an eight-year contract with Timo Meyer in New Jersey, but he hasn't performed up to expectation Recently, he's been better, but you look at this trade now and you realize the the other solution for San Jose would have been to keep Meyer and sign him for eight years. It didn't make financial sense for them to keep Timo Meyer. It just didn't. And and this is one of those decisions I wish more GMs would make, where you have to look at where your team's at and say, you know what, it doesn't make sense for us to keep this guy and sign him to a big eight year contract for a lot of money, especially if he's you know in his late twenties, because by the time we're good, that contract's not going to look great because his stats are going to be dropping off. Um, But still, uh, letting go of Pavelski was a huge mistake for them because he doesn't age. So I think this trade's worked out pretty well for San Jose. I do. I honestly think you look at it, Zetterlund's been their most dangerous forward this season. We can all joke around about how they're 32nd in the league, but, or well, they've been, they've been alternating that with Chicago. But would, it, would adding Timo Meyer to the San Jose Sharks team as it's currently constituted, and if you took these players away, would they be better? My answer to that would be no. Um, and again, people will comment about, well, he didn't get enough. But if that's all you're being offered, and this is what people don't, don't seem to want to consider is, maybe you call 31 teams and this is your best offer. Maybe that's it. So if you hold on to the player... You're going to have fans and media saying, why are they holding on to this guy? They need to trade him. And then when you trade the player, you get, they should have got more back. But the the way that I used to put it before I had a channel and everything, if I was talking to somebody on message boards and forums, and they would say, uh, this team should have got more for this player. I would say, okay, all right. So which team should they have traded with? What assets would that team have traded to them? How do you make that work? Show me, Show me your work. There were times where somebody would say they could trade with this team and the trade would be ridiculous. And I'd be like, there's there's no way that that team would offer that much for that player. And I think at times we overestimate what a player's worth based on name value. And so for a team acquiring a player, they might go, you know what, that's a big name, but you're asking us to take on this guy who's going to want an eight-year extension. You're asking us to take on this guy who's maybe he's had injury issues. Maybe he hasn't had a really, really productive year. General managers are going to play hardball because they don't want to pay a ton for a player, right? And in this case, I I don't know if New Jersey would redo this. I don't know. Because by adding Meyer, there's a lot of issues that the team in New Jersey has right now that are not scoring related. And if you take Meyer out of that lineup, yes, that would hurt their offense a bit. 
But if you had that mil that the millions and millions of dollars that gave Meyer, and if you use that on a goaltender and a defenseman, right? Like it's an argument that people use over and over and over again about Toronto. They're not the only team in the league that can make that kind of an error where the amount of money that's that's invested into forwards might be a little bit high, that kind of thing, right? But uh, I think San Jose's done all right with that trade. I will defend that one. I think that one turned out okay. And again, at the time, we all looked at that and went, because mm -hmm. Zetterland looked lost in New Jersey at the time of the trade. I think Zetterland's been pretty good. I think he's earned the right to stay in San Jose for a while. Uh, March the 3rd of 2023, they traded Vlad Nemesnikov, who they had acquired for Mikey Asimon, uh, to Winnipeg for a 2024 fourth round pick. Now, I, I think Winnipeg's quite happy with this trade. It's why it's on the board, because Nemesnikov's been a really solid addition for Winnipeg. It was a really smart move to pick him up, not dissimilar to Aiden Hill going to Vegas. The difference being, at this point, we don't have a Stanley Cup for Winnipeg. I don't want to be a doom and gloom guy. Maybe they do get a Stanley Cup. Maybe Nemestikov gets the game winner uh, in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. But uh, that's definitely a player that has worked out really, really well for the Winnipeg Jets. June 27th of 2023, they traded a uh, 2023 sixth-round pick, which became Cole Brown to New Jersey in exchange for Mackenzie Blackwood. So for the New Jersey Devils, yeah, Blackwood had to go, and San Jose picks him up. Now keep in mind, this is the same team they dealt with here. If you add Blackwood to this trade, to the Meyer trade, and you add a sixth round pick on this side, all of a sudden that trade looks like it might kind of favor San Jose. Blackwood's had a good year. I would even argue Blackwood's had a better year than Vanacek or Dawes or Schmidt. And now uh, they've traded Kakinen in exchange for Vanacek, and they got a draft pick in that trade as well. And Kakinen at times has looked good, at times not so good. So the fact San Jose gets, gets multiple assets, and I understand too that the contract that they acquire with Vanacek is a higher price than the one they gave up with Kakinen, I still think that's a good trade. I, I do, because they added an asset. And it's, it's not like, you know, Kakinen was going to be this fantastic goaltender. I don't expect an Aiden Hill, like, turnaround from him. It could happen, sure. So I think that Blackwood trade was pretty good. And I think they've done a, a really decent job with New Jersey to the point where if San Jose calls New Jersey, I wouldn't blame them for saying, don't don't answer that. Just, just let it go to voicemail. So August 6th of 2023, there's a big three-way deal. And there's definitely something to discuss here. And this was where I think we got a picture of just how much uh, San Jose had committed to just the full teardown. So going to Montreal, Jeff Petrie did not stay in Montreal. Casey DeSmith did not stay in Montreal. Nathan Laguerre, who was betrayed this week in a minor league deal, he didn't stay in Montreal. I believe it was Laguerre that went. Uh, and a 2025 second round pick that was Pittsburgh's goes to Montreal in exchange for Eric Carlson with $1.5 million retained by San Jose. Uh, Dylan Hamaliak going to Pittsburgh as well. A 2026 third that was San Jose's, as well as Rem Pitlick. Now going to San Jose, Mike Hoffman, that's been kind of a disaster. Hoffman this year, it has not been a good year for Mike Hoffman. I can't even pretend that it's been a good year. Michael Granlund has been arguably their most creative forward. If Zetterlund's been their most consistent, Granlund the most exciting and the most creative. And I think Granlund's enjoying it in San Jose, to be honest. Uh, Jan Ruda, who has at times been pretty productive and played pretty well for San Jose too. And a 2024 first from Pittsburgh, which is top 10 protected. And at the time, it was seen as, well, maybe, you know, if, San Jose, if Pittsburgh can't get into the playoffs, with the way Pittsburgh's been playing lately, it is quite possible, if not probable, to get a top 10 draft pick, which means that becomes a... 2025 first round pick which would not be lottery protected so again i think san jose does okay in that trade considering eric carlson goes to pittsburgh they don't become a playoff team carlson's 100 point season in san jose didn't translate to a 100 point season in pittsburgh far from it he's not a point per game player in pittsburgh because his role's changed right um very similar to at the start where i talked about burns goes and carlson becomes a star well carlson goes to pittsburgh I think it's had a negative impact on himself and on Latang as well in terms of point totals and overall output. Uh, then we get to the March 8th, 2024 draft pick. So, or 2024 draft pick. 2024 trade. And uh, this is the one from four days ago. So, Tomas Hurdle goes to the Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, $1,387,500 retained by the San Jose Sharks in that deal. So, they have three, t three retention slots in the National Hockey League. San Jose's used them all. First on the Brent Burns deal. 
Uh, they did retain on Meyer, but that was just for the rest of that season. They retained on Carlson, and now they've retained on Hurdle. Also a 2025 third round pick and a 2027 third round pick going to Vegas from San Jose. The fact that that's next year and three years from now, I think it mitigates some of the damage that that, that might cause. And again, third round draft picks, I think it's a 12% chance they become National Hockey League players. Going the other way, a 2025 first round draft pick for Vegas. And David Edstrom, who was a first round draft pick last year. So you get, and I've seen people say it's a B-level prospect, and he's not very good. You know what? Until a guy reaches the NHL, we don't really know. Uh, maybe Edstrom in the San Jose organization maybe works out really, really well for him. Uh, and that 2025 first, we don't know what that's going to be. And what's interesting is, so let's just say Pittsburgh drafts in the top 10. That draft pick becomes San Jose's. They've got Vegas's. Well, now they've got three first-round draft picks next year. And what could be a good draft? Now, one thing with San Jose that I wanted to have on the board was like all this draft capital. They don't have that yet. They haven't stockpiled draft picks like, say, Montreal or Arizona has. But again, remember, they've been fighting the rebuild going back to as recently as 2022. Before they they hire Mike Greer, and then when Greer's hired, they're, well, we're not doing a rebuild. We want to stay in contention. We think with the right moves, we can make it to the playoffs. It became really, really, really obvious really early that that was not going to happen. So Greer's had to kind of pivot on, on the spot. And I don't think that's been easy for San Jose, for management and ownership. Uh, but think about it this way. Their projected cap space for July 1st is like everybody's mad about the retention. Burns' retention is until next year. So that one comes off next year. Uh, the retention on Carlson's till 2027. The retained salary for Hurdle is until 2030. But you had to get rid of those contracts. Their cap space on July the 1st, according to Cap Friendly, $38,045,000. And the funny thing is, when I when I pointed out after this trade, hey, this, this frees up a lot of cap space, the response was, well, who cares about cap space? It's San Jose. Everybody cares about cap space. San Jose is now the team that, that is going to get called when the team has a contract they want to get rid of. We want to get rid of this contract. Now, they can get first-round draft picks bringing guys in. They can get first-round draft picks just for taking a crappy contract off somebody else's hands. The good news is GMs are always signing bad contracts, so there's never going to be a shortage of contracts that they can acquire. And potentially, if they're like Arizona, they can get guys on a dime. So pick up guys as free agents who had a rough year the year before, rehabilitate their contracts, and then trade them out for better assets. Arizona's been able to do that. Montreal's been able to do that. And now it's up to San Jose to start doing the same thing. And that's where you start building your draft capital. That's where you start building your, your prospect pool. San Jose was good for a long time. So their prospect pool was not good for a long time. And it's part of what we're witnessing now. They needed to, you know, get their prospect pool up. This is part of why you acquire so many assets in these trades. And then there's some contracts on here still that ha or that are going to come off. Grandland is a $5 million cap hit that comes off next year. They have $62 million in cap space uh, July the 1st of 2025. Obviously, it's a long way off from there, but showing you, this is a team that's going to be in really good cap space, uh, in a good cap space situation, which a rebuilding team should be. Rebuilding teams should have a ton of cap space. Um, Vlasic's $7 million contract, his cap hit, comes off the books in 2027. Logan Couture's $8 million cap hit comes off the books in 2027 as well. So there's the possibility that we'll see some of their prospects. I didn't even put the prospects on the board because I feel like we're still seeing them add to that prospect list. And those prospects are going to be coming into their own. By the time that Couture and Vlasic's contracts run out, should they finish those contracts in San Jose, you're going to be looking at being able to pay for some of those young players who by that point in time should be growing into star players. Uh, Will Smith's one example. Uh, Eklund is another example. Uh, Eklund's had some up and down moments this year, but I think the potential is there for him to be a top six forward who's very productive at the NHL level. And so San Jose now is, is just they're acquiring young players. So trading out Hurdle. I think part of it is that as as a fan, you identify with the players. I've talked about this before. We get really attached to the players. And so it's really hard to see them leave. And I get that part. But as a general manager, you have to kind of separate yourself from that and just realize you're building all of these future assets and that it's going to get better later. 
and holding on to a veteran player, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when it's not going to make the team a lot better. That's the allowance for Meyer to go rather than trying to hold on to him. And they did. They did try to hold on to Meyer for as long as they could and realized it's not going to happen. So they, they moved him. And I thought they did pretty well considering the situation at the time where Meyer uh, had the $10 million qualifying offer just hanging out there. And San Jose didn't want to do the $10 million qualifying offer. So uh, I think they've done well. I'm not saying they've done great in the trades, but I, I don't understand the the absolute ridicule that I've seen of Mike Greer because if you're looking at a if you're looking at a rebuild and saying, well, you can measure it by cap space and by prospects, the prospects are on the way. There's some prospects getting into the lineup now, and that cap space is going to be ridiculous this summer. So San Jose could use that cap space to really improve their future. And so we'll see what they do uh, come July and August. And between now and July, whether or not they pick up a bad contract, because remember, seller, when, when July the 1st rolls around, uh, there are some teams that don't have cap space for next year that are going to want to get a free agent. And San Jose's phone is going to ring. And they're going to say, look, we really want this guy. Like Sam Reinhardt. Let's just say Reinhardt doesn't sign in Florida. And if there's teams looking at Reinhardt and going, we really want Reinhardt, but he's going to cost us a lot of money, San Jose's phone may ring. And it may be, hey, we, we need to move this contract because we're going to get Sam Reinhardt. Or maybe you sign Reinhardt on July the 1st and then July the 3rd, because you can be over the cap by 10% in the offseason. July the 3rd, all of a sudden we have a trade going to San Jose to make up the difference in cap money. So keep an eye on San Jose over this summer. I think it's way too early to decide, oh, nope, this is it. They're screwed up. This is stupid. This is terrible. And some of the comments I've seen from people about, oh, I'm never cheering for this team again. You will. You will. I have seen many Canuck fans over the years say, I'm never cheering for this team again. They're all wearing Canuck jerseys. I'm pretty excited this year about how the team's looking. So I do expect fans will return. Obviously, the attendance in San Jose this year has been abysmal. But the on-ice product hasn't been very good either. So I totally understand that side as well. I have never once complained about the empty seats in San Jose. They're very notable. The flashing lights make them more notable. Might be something to keep in mind if you're Mike Greer and just and management for the Sharks. Maybe you don't have the flashing lights showing us empty, 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 empty. Uh, maybe, just, maybe just hold off on that until the team gets better. Anyways, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below as always. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe in the event you haven't done so already. I just, I wanted to do a deep dive into the Sharks today because I feel like it's really easy to take the hurdle, the hurdle trade and just slap that down and go, see, this is an example of how bad this team is being managed, but you have to look at it in the grand scheme of things, which is we need to get rid of these eight year extensions. We need to get rid of these anchor contracts. And for these veteran players, they generally don't want to be in a rebuilding situation in their thirties where they know your time in the NHL is limited. You want a chance to win a Stanley Cup. So we'll see what happens with Couture, Vlasic, Granlund. Um, I would expect Granlund probably stays for next year. And I think Couture and Vlasic will decide what happens with them as well. But the problem being, I will agree, with the retention slots all being used, it makes it far more difficult to move Vlasic or Couture because teams would want you to retain salary. So we'll see what happens. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And hey, I will talk to you again soon.